Hi, everyone. Welcome to our live stream series we're calling Meet a Scientist. The Youth Bio Lab at the Albertson Research Center in St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba is on Treaty 1 territory, the land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Denny people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. This week, I'm coming at you live from my home, and today we're going to get to meet Dana al Hatab, a master's student in Dr. Mike, or sorry, a PhD student now in Dr. Mike Schubert's Molecular Pathophysiology Lab, which is part of our Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences. I'm also keeping an eye on our chat, so if you have any questions for Dana, you can join us there too. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the show, this is Dana working in Mike Schubert's Molecular Pathophysiology Lab. I'll stop the share so that you can see a bit more of her talking with us too. So welcome to the show, Dana. Um, thanks for making some time for us today. Um, so to start out, we often just like to ask our scientists from the research center, um, things like, you know, what, what brought you to science? Were you always interested in it growing up or did you know you wanted to be a research scientist? How did you get to where you are today? Uh, hi, first, uh, thank you for um, having me with this uh, nice bio lab program. Um, so I want to say that I, I've been always interested in being a scientist and I was like, although I don't have, I didn't have much experience in the research, in the techniques, but I was always interested in how scientists would find things and investigate things and, and like get drugs done. So like, that's what I wanted to learn. And uh, although I came from a different background, my bachelor degree was in dentistry. Uh, but like after working for some time, I thought like it would be really interesting to look for more challenging and solving some puzzles by looking into uh, heart research in basic. Yeah. Hmm. So you have a degree in dentistry already? Yes, I, I got the degree. And do you practice in dentistry before for a while before deciding like, oh, you know, maybe I want to know a little bit more about what's going on behind these different problems that we're seeing? So, uh, yes, I practiced dentistry for four years in Jordan. And then okay. I decided to uh, come and join uh, the research center and like research in the research in the heart and where to go better than coming to the research center um, Cassand Boniface Research Center. It's well known. So that's why I came here. Yes. Yeah. So how do you, so like if you're working as a dentist in Jordan, how did you find out about the interest of this research center or Mike's lab in particular, Dr. Schubert? Like how does that connection work from, you know, studying in a different field to saying, oh, actually I want to switch gears and pursue benchtop science and like that's the lab that I want to work in. How, how does that happen? So uh, Dr. Schubert's lab is one of uh, the well-known labs and it got like uh, a very high reputation with all the papers and I really got interested in the heart research in basics and like understanding the mechanics of the heart and how it's going. Uh, I wasn't hmm. really aware of like Winnipeg in general or how living in Winnipeg would be that cold, <laughs> but I felt like yeah. it would be interesting to discover new things and have like new challenges. And yeah. I didn't have experience in research. So I just, well, why, why don't we try it? And it was really a nice experience. That's why I started my master's with Dr. Schubert. And now I'm completing my PhD with him as well. Okay, so when you, if you already have a dentistry degree, when you apply, so you applied to the U of M to work with Dr. Schubert, is yes. that how it works? And you have course, yes. some coursework and then some research work. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, were you, is there anything that, you know, was unexpected or different than you pictured it would be? Like from your ideas of, oh, I want to go into more of the science field. And then what is it actually like compared to what you expected? Well, uh, first, like changing from uh, diff from one country to another, it was a little bit of a challenge for me and for my family. So it's a little bit, I, as I told you, it's a little, it's more colder than <laughs> being in Jordan. And also, um, it's it's very um, 
it's a new language for us as well um like adaptation and the life um style and also um like we we thought like when you read a paper or an article you we feel that oh, okay they did this and that and you wouldn't uh value the amount of effort and amount of uh like a lot of disappointed disappointments to oh. reach to that point where you get the data that you would you'd, you would be sure that you want to represent in your paper so this is one oh. of the parts that it's really hard and challenging in being part of science Yeah, I think a lot of people do sometimes have the idea that scientific discovery is more like this is what I think will happen and then I'll do a test to prove myself right and then I have that solution, but I've also I've heard a lot of people say, you know, the some of the more important discoveries in bench top science is what doesn't work or like exactly. when you think that you're going to get these results and then it doesn't work and then you have to ask, well why like why and what's going on or what are the alternate solution or like the troubleshooting what did what why did this go wrong what's happening with this and sometimes oh. you will get new discoveries with that and would be you will be very happy so it's it's different from one part to another yeah yeah so complicated so <laughs> you you became interested in hearts as your focus before even coming here necessarily that's how you found Dr. Schubert's lab what have you been working on with him So uh our lab we we basically um like we can call our lab as fibrosis lab. So um it's the lab that we will look at the molecules and how they affect the fibrosis process. Well fibrosis from the word it's like a lot of proteins and fibers that they interact and make like a form of a mesh that would be over the heart. and uh our lab has been working on like ha- how this fibrosis could like if there's injury in the heart or heart attack and this uh p- like a kind of scar or a patch that would make the heart uh not functioning well and not be able to pump in an efficient way for the mm-hmm. uh, so we looked at a certain protein which is caraxes in our lab and how this protein would affect the heart in in its ability to function uh, like less like improper and then uh, if we remove this or to make this key target protein removed what would happen would that improve the function of the heart to make it pump properly and we found that mm-hmm. yes caraxes uh helps in the build up of the proteins that would form the mesh that will mm-hmm. impair the heart function yes okay so just as a review i think there are a lot of words in there even that are a bit complicated so to paint a picture of it like your lab is looking at you know the bad effects that happen with heart disease and and specifically fibrosis but you also you sent me a paper and we've talked with Michael a bit before about high blood pressure being involved so like when people hear heart disease there are like all these different things that can happen to people so high blood pressure we know is part of it or you mentioned heart attacks um but the idea is you know any injury to the heart changes those tissues and yes. so you it's said so you're studying fibrosis so that's the reaction of the heart creating more fibers and getting stiff and tough yes so when i was looking at some of the research i googled scleraxis just to make sure i had a clear understanding of it and it seems to be in lots of different parts of the body and like the cells that create the matrix the gluey stuff there in different parts of the body too so so scleraxis isn't only something that's in the heart when the heart is suffering but can you tell us what what is it seem to be doing like it's bad right scleraxis is bad uh, well it's not that bad well let's say that during the progression of uh for example in the development it the scleraxis is there there is like the ability like, of the scleraxis Yes. Like so, developing? yes. Okay. So this was part of my master's degree um, project, which was is the ability of the uh, the scleraxis to differentiate some cells or more, make more cells uh, from epithelium to mesenchymal. So like 
these types of cells to make them more mm -hmm. special specialized. Also, it, it has the function of changing the cells within the heart from fibroblast to myofibroblast. It activates the fibrosis, uh, fibrosis um, mm -hmm. process as well. So, so I've heard... I've heard before, I just want to go back because that differentiation, that's fairly complicated. And if we have any students even in high school that are kind of learning about cell types and their jobs or different tissue structures, um, like differentiation is the idea that some cells can still sort of shift what type they're becoming. Like if you go back to stem cells, those can differentiate into anything. Yes. Um, but, and you said, so I, I was under the impression that epithelial cells couldn't differentiate into mesoderm but you're saying so some of those like skin or covering cells are triggered by sclerapsis to become connective tissue forming cells yes so that's that's the point and that's what happens during development during certain diseases for example do you even during the like they looked at this EMT they call it EMT epithelial to mesenchymal transition so they looked at that so uh, it, it happens also in the cancer in the metastasis so what happens mm. is that there is some injury to the to the cell structure that have that triggers the sclerosis to turn on and then the sclerosis would affect other proteins and these proteins will be responsible for this process. So mm. yeah, so looking at the sclerosis, it's like we're looking at it from different aspects. So my master's uh, project was different from like now my PhD project. My PhD project now, our lab has shown that sclerosis would uh, help like well, like sclerosis would affect the stiffness within the heart, and now what I want to look at is what sclerosis would affect the forming the stiffness within the vessels. Well, that's what we call like uh, vascular fibrosis. You know, so okay. yeah, and this like vascular fibrosis, it's usually happened in in patients with high blood pressure. Um, like there is some dysfunction within the vessel wall that causes this to uh, occur and we want to see what if like we want to represent that in a way that if we have an animal model that has hypertension and like we do that with mini pumps and with infusing with a uh, drug that causes this hypertension and it's usually with people with hypertension they have stiff vessels so mm -hmm. when you have a stiff vessel like uh, the vessel become more thick and there would be a mesh of proteins that would make the vessel thick and would impair the flow, the regular flow of the blood to end organs. And that's what happens in like in patients with hypertension. And we want to see what if we take out sclerosis at this point, would that help? to improve the hypertension in patients with that. So this is what we're doing in a, an animal model for now. Okay, so just to kind of reiterate some of that for people watching again, um, I'll share my screen again to just this little PowerPoint, just the idea that, you know, in a healthy artery, there's some smooth muscle in here, there are some connective tissues represented by these blue areas. And then there's enough room for the blood cells to get through in the lumen. The purple would be like endothelial cells. But so after chronic hypertension, so that means like high blood pressure over a long time, these walls of the arteries get thicker. And then you're saying also there are more cells within that muscular artery wall that create the gluey fibers. Yes. So so if these would normally be really stretchy, what, what happens to that actual artery? So, so there's not enough as, as much room for blood vessel or blood to go through to get through the different organs. Um, are there other problems that arise from that thicken or stiff artery wall? So this is the idea. We want to see exactly what sclerosis would affect the, uh, the proteins that are forming the mesh. 
and this mesh could be in all different layers and also yeah. in the smooth muscle layer does it help in the proliferation in the increasing the number of the smooth muscle cells within the artery would it make it harder for the vessel to um to like adapt the elasticity. So these are the things that we want to see. And if you can imagine like normal healthy artery, this is very nice uh, image. Like if you look at the healthy uh, artery, it's just like a balloon. So once you it gets the mm. blood, it's like inflates. Okay. Yes. And then uh, if it want to spread the blood, it will be it, it would contract and it will spread the blood uh, at a certain uh, regulatory level to all organs. However, if you look at the hypertensive stiff vessel, you would think about it. It's like blocks of or like it's a wall that it won't be able to respond to increase of mm. the blood or d decrease, for example, the the heart the body um need for the blood and nutrients wouldn't be um efficient as it should be so that will mm -hmm. make it more harder for the uh vessel to become more stiff that's that's the uh, the image it, yeah yeah because i guess we often think or like we imagine you know the heart is the muscle that pumps the blood so like if we picture you know the heart's doing all of the work but in healthy arteries those muscles along the tubes are actually helping push the blood forward so so not only are they stiffer and can't stretch but they also aren't helping to push that blood forward so yeah. so there's probably gonna be systemic effects um we had a question in our chat um a wondering are all, so how many people are affected by high blood pressure is it a big problem here or is it a small problem so uh high pro uh, like uh cardiac diseases in general are the main leading uh cause of death worldwide mm -hmm. and hypertension is uh one of like about uh 300 million people each year like they they get um uh, high blood pressure and mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the high blood pressure you would see that uh, it's not like people take for example why are we looking for fibrosis and the stiffness because usually people have controlled drugs to uh, try to control the blood pressure but after like a while lowering medication to, yes to lower the blood pressure but after what uh, after some time uh, these lowering blood pressure drugs won't be as effective as they started with because mm -hmm. there would be like dysfunction within the vessels themselves and that would cause the irreversible damage that happens to the vessel that uh, not only lowering uh, drugs would be able to help but all, but you need more drugs or you need something adjacent to help in the regulation of the blood vessels and the heart as um, well. Okay, so even the drugs that target high blood pressure, they might be lowering the blood pressure, but they're not fixing the artery walls. Yes. That's part of the problem. Okay. So are you looking at, so in your lab, you said you're looking at what happens if we take out or lower the scleraxis activity. Scleraxis is a protein? Yes. Okay, so but it causes it causes all these changes that make the artery wall thicker. So if you take away the scleraxis, then maybe those you think you might be able to reverse the damage in those artery walls. Yes, that's what we're hoping to do. So, um, and we want to see like we're taking out scleraxis from each component of the vessel. So we're we're taking out the scleraxis from a model where you can have the adventitia, and we take the the scleraxis and see if that brings the elasticity to the vessel, or we take yeah. it out from the smooth muscle cell and we see if that helps the elasticity. I haven't looked for the model for the endothelial yet because that would be beyond my PhD. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at the function. So I'm in my third year now. Um, so we have like this nice technique. It was really hard and it was very specific. Uh, it's called pressure myography. So um, I'm hoping that if students would come like after COVID to come and join us, they will see. So what happens is that we cannulate little 
um, little vessels from the mesenteries and like we tie them and we tie it from one side and the, from the other side we add the pressure on a closed pressure system and then you can okay. see how the vessel if it's like elastic enough it would move if you like block it from the calcium and, and you remove the myogenic activity it would move like a balloon while if you have a stiff oh. artery you increase the pressure as much as you can like for 140 and it you will see only little dif like little difference in the movement and that's why it will tell you exactly how the vessel is like the components are stiff that it's not even okay. moving with the increase in the pressure and it's i think it's a nice image it, like if you like look at it it would be nice to uh illustrate yeah Mm hmm. Yes. But I mean, the analogy that you gave before of it being like a balloon, that's pretty clear. You know, you could have like a really stiff, hard rubber balloon that's really hard to blow up. And that's your heart doing that work. Or exactly. you can have a like a nice, flexible balloon that inflates easily. And that's probably easier on your heart and gets more blood out to your system. So that's I think that's a really good description. Are there any things so you're you're using some molecular genetics or something to take out the sclerosis from your models how how does that translate into people is there is the future that maybe there will be a drug that people take when they have high blood pressure that can reduce the activity of sclerosis in their heart or is it dietary or is it what it what does that look like in people so uh, we're starting with animal models, but we're hoping that this will give us uh, like knowing this base, these basics on how to affect the sclerosis uh, will be able to help us in to uh, modulate this and be able to have this and in, in the humans. Uh, actually, our lab is working on like certain small molecules that could block the effect, uh, the ability of the Pro of the sclerosis to bind mm -hmm. to other uh, proteins in order to activate them and make uh, and like make it more able increase the ability of the fibrosis to happen. So we're ha we're having this as a sclerosis could be a key target in our um, drug therapy or in the drug uh, design that we're planning to have uh, to use in a human models. Um, probably five, 10 years from now. Uh, it depends on how things go. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm glad that you like brought that into the picture of the conversation. Cause like, you know, it's, it's a group of people that are working together on like this area of the heart disease problem. So your project in the lab is trying to figure out, you know, like what are all of the actions that Sclerosis does to say, you know, yes, we need to target this or no, it's not actually gonna be an important target. And then other people in your lab are working on what are the molecules that can affect the activity of square axis. How many different people or like how many different projects do, would you say your lab is working on at the same time with different students? So um, now currently we are uh, like three PhD students and we have um, uh, two technicians. And each of us has our own project. We're looking at um, like wand, uh, wand healing, um, like the, not only the effect of sclerosis on the heart or in the vessels, we are looking at and the wands, uh, like on the skin. Uh, we're looking at, oh. different, yeah, so we're looking at different aspects on how this sclerosis could work. We're looking at the mechanisms. So like you can say about like we have, five six projects going on in, in the lab yeah it's it's a huge work mm. and it's a teamwork yeah. as well so we help each other we have like certain models that could uh we combine with each other on some help out uh learning new techniques uh together on like we we teach each other about the techniques about um mm. we have like a group discussion uh, meetings with our supervisor and that's really helpful we used to have like summer students as well like they used to join mm -hmm. our lab and that i think that would be if anyone is he like anyone who's listening to me and like he's interested in getting into the field of research it would be an, an amazing opportunity to get to work hand like side by side with scientists with students and 
maybe after getting to know your techniques, you will be able to get your hands on some uh, your own project for like science fair or whatever. Like it, yeah. it is very nice. And maybe you would have your own paper with with us. So that would be amazing opportunity to uh, look for. Yeah, when you, so we get students coming through our lab sometimes, and we have directed a few students to, you know, to email professors and say, tell them what they're interested in. And, and a few students that have come through us have actually worked in Mike's lab in the past as summer students. Is that also the path that you kind of had to take when you decided, oh, I want to study like cardiovascular health and maybe hypertension? Did you just email Dr. Schubert and say like, I've looked up your research and this is what I'm interested in or yes. how... And it's, I actually, I applied, that said, I, Fine, yes. I, I applied for the, uh, for University of Manitoba and I, I sent an email to Dr. Schubert as well. So it was, yeah. it wasn't for me, like I didn't have the time to get uh, like experience. I didn't have any experience in research and it's not about the techniques that you want to mm -hmm. learn. It's uh, the whole thing. Even like I have learned new things by being in the lab with Dr. Schubert, like for example, like giving presentations. I wasn't like mm. an expert in that and I've, I'm learning that. So that would be uh, an amazing opportunity. So uh, mm. looking for the uh, I, I looked through the universities. I wanted to complete my studies in Canada and I will look at for uh, places where I can have like heart diseases, um, like investigation or research. And um, I wanted to get a degree for that because um, mm -hmm. my ultimate goal is to reach to um, a faculty position in academia where I can be able to teach students. Well, that's what I like. And mm -hmm. also to run my own lab in the research. And that's what my ultimate goal for. So that's why okay. I came here. Yeah. So eventually you want to be like a new Mike Schubert directing your own lab and instructing at university and giving all these presentations. Yes. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so we've only got a few minutes left, but to wrap up kind of, what are some of the things that you feel benefited you transitioning into science? Like what are, you've already said, you know, like if people can, you would suggest they try working as a student in labs. Uh, like, what do you think, has made that transition work for you into bench shop science? Well, um, honestly, if you want to look for any student who would like to look for graduate uh, studies, first they have like they should have like the passion to you to be interested in the subject that you're working on and mm -hmm. to look for a good supervisor, a good leader would be able to push you forward to be able to uh, mm -hmm. like write. I, like for me, I wasn't a, like even the writing, I had the writing skills, but the scientific writing was a little bit challenging as well. Mm -hmm. And like being able mm -hmm. to participate in meetings and be able to present your data, it's something that you need support. Uh, you need support from your supervisor, you need support from your colleagues and your lab members. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's a teamwork that you need to uh, be able to do work with and that what really helped me actually. And of course the family support is the most important and like how my husband has mm -hmm. been supporting me all the time uh, for that it's really challenging to be a grad student with family but you you keep your priorities mm -hmm. so yeah awesome yeah it's really I think also people sometimes have this idea of science as just being an individual scientist working on their little thing but it really is like an enormous team of people that are all kind of interconnected and sharing ideas like you suggested. So that's great. And Mike's lab, Dr. Schubert's lab is very, very great. He's a, he's a great uh, leader, I would say. I'm so curious. So that's definitely like, you can see the passion and some of the, some of the people around the research center that like, that's part of their great leadership is that they're so curious themselves. Yeah. Um, a la last question, though, what do you think you'd be doing, you know, if you didn't pursue science? Like what what's your alternate life plan? <laughs> well, I, I would stay as a dentist for I, I think and I would um, 
probably complete my studies and become, um, I, I, I'm, I love like teaching students. So that's mm -hmm. what I like. So probably I would teach in dentistry rather than teaching and research and cardio and pathophysiology. So yeah, that, that would sometimes, be, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you really know your interests. So if it's body related or health related, then that's, that's your true calling. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's probably all we have time for today. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas and your experiences with us, Dana, uh, and good luck. When do you think you'll be done Thank your you. PhD? When do you become a professor? Well, hopefully in less than two years, probably. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a long game, especially when you're perfecting techniques. But either way, yeah. thank you for joining us for our Meta thank Scientist you. series. Um, and for everyone watching, Join us again next week. We have new scientists on every week. And we're not sure who next week is yet. We're hopefully getting somebody from the uh, Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences. But you can keep up to date with us by subscribing to our YouTube channel for updates. You can also check us out at youthbiolab.ca and follow us on Youth Biolab on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for watching and stay safe. Thank you. Hi.